Morning. I guess now I can introduce myself. My name is Joanna DeWolf. I'm, um, I attend the Lansing Central Free Methodist Church, and um, I am actually an ordained pastor. I'm just not on the staff of the church right now. Uh, Superintendent Button has changed my appointment this year to conference support or something. I think that means that he wants to be able to call me whenever he wants and ask me to do whatever he wants me to do. I haven't asked him quite that directly, but I think that might be it. Um, so, Pastor Doug was my youth pastor. So, you can blame anything I say today on him, right? Uh, somehow I survived that, and um, somehow he survived and became a senior pastor, but I have long, long history with Pastor Doug, um, and with several of you in this congregation. A whole lot of you I don't know. I'm happy to be here. I am um, married, have two children, 16 and 13. Yes, I have entered the two teenagers stage of life. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, and uh, let's see. I do lots of different ministry things. Um, mostly I spend a lot of time these days with refugees in the Lansing community. Uh, nine years ago, God asked me to host my children never planned to do that. That wasn't in my plan for my life. And my complaint to God was, my world will get so small. Six months after I started homeschooling, 50 Nepali refugees showed up in my home church. My children and I have now had meals in Nepali homes, Burmese homes, Congolese homes. We have met people from around the world. My world has not been so small after all. Because <laughs> that's how God works, right? So this morning, the chances are, if you are sitting in this church building on a Sunday morning, it's because sometime or another you have heard God's voice. It could have been years ago sitting in a camp meeting or a revival service or even a Billy Graham crusade for that all, right? Deep inside you knew that God Jesus died for you and the Spirit was calling you to follow. So you did. You heard God's voice and you followed. Or maybe you were in a hospital room, more scared than you'd ever been at what the doctors were saying or not saying, and deep inside you knew that there was a God and that he in fact was your only hope. And you made a deal with him. If you bring me out of this place, if you speak over me here and now, then I'll follow you. I'll go to church. And here you are. You heard God's voice, and you followed. Or maybe it wasn't that dramatic for you. Maybe you were living life, doing your job each day, paying the bills, cleaning house, watching TV, and this hole kept growing in you. There has to be something more. Is there a purpose for my life? Why am I here? And maybe you stumbled across a book for a friend or a church sign, and you realized that God might be the answer, the bigger purpose. You heard God's voice, and you followed. So here you sit in a church building. But here is possibly a tough place to be these days. Your church has been going through some tough losses over the last few and many of you personally have gone through suffering and pain unlike you ever thought would have imagined, you imagined would have happened to you. It always happened to other people. You may be feeling numb or empty or lost or wondering how to find your ways forward. I've been there more than once. These are the times for me when I have found that first I needed to remind myself that I have heard God's voice before. You all are here because you have heard God's voice before. And that you have felt, and that I, I remind myself, I have felt God's presence before. And you all have felt God's presence before. I remind myself that God has shown up in unmistakable and unexpected ways, right in the middle of my pain in the past. And I'm pretty sure God has done that for most of you as well. And with those memories, I turn once again to the only one who knows the way forward for me. The more I read the Bible and learn from other followers of Jesus and live more of my life with the more I've come to realize that the real 
joy in Jesus comes in that continued following. I sometimes like to call it heeding God. Heeding is a really old-fashioned word. You probably haven't heard that in the last 10 years of your life, to heed something, right? It's um, more than simply listen or hear. It's to listen and to follow. That's why I like the word so much. I always think of an old man bent over giving advice to a boy on a path, right? Like passing each other on the path and an old man saying, my words, right? Heed. Don't just hear what I say, but listen and do something about it, right? And as I've thought about and practiced this heeding God in my life, it does often seem to follow a general pattern. And again, when I'm going through tough times, I tend to return to the patterns that have worked for me in the past. Sometimes going back to the very basic sorts of things. And although the pattern comes out different every single time, and although when I look at other people in my life who I know are listening and following the voice of God, it looks as different in each one of them as each one of them are, there still are these kind of elements, these things that happen to make it work in their lives. So look at... Um, there's a story in scripture when Jesus was here and from Peter, Simon Peter's life, that kind of show these elements of what it's, it looks like to heed God. If you want to open your Bibles, if you have them, we are going to be reading from Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 1. And today I'm reading from the New Living Translation that you should be able to follow along in any way. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. That Jesus, he's kind of forward, right? Just walk into someone's boat. Hey, could you push this out in the water for me? So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Now this is actually really cool. Um, how many of you like to, are, are lake water people? A few, a few. Okay. Oh, oh, more brave souls, okay. So um, I have not always been much of a lake water person, although I've become more so as I've gotten older. Uh, but I did a trip to Israel when I was in college and got to be right along the Sea of Galilee. And one of the things they said to us and that we tried out is that if you sit on the beach, there's certain ways that, that lakes and beaches are that if you're at the beach and everyone else is around, that becomes kind of a natural sound system. So because Jesus was there on the water, then all of these crowds could hear better because of how it was all. So he had it all set up. He didn't need Wes, the sound guy. That'd be nice, huh? <laughs> so he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets and you will catch many fish. Again, Okay, first of all, Jesus takes the boat. Now he's telling the fishermen how to do his job. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, we'll try again. And this time, their nets were so full they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the size of their catch, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, 
you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Lord Jesus, may we hear from you today and not from me. Speak directly to our hearts the word, the question, the direction that each of us need to hear for this day to help us to find our way forward. In Jesus' name, amen. So usually I have a PowerPoint, but I was not organized to get it here earlier, so I will try to make sure I'm repeating the main points for you this morning. So the first thing when I think about finding my way forward, heeding God, hearing what he has to say to me and following, is number one is in Luke 5, verses 1 and 2. He was, Jesus was preaching on the Sea of Galilee, and there were two groups of people, right? First of all, there were the crowds who came to hear him, and secondly, there was Simon Peter and the fishermen. So first of all is um, be in a place to hear the word of God. Now the first group of people were intentionally in a place to hear the word of God, right? They came to hear Jesus speak. And that's one of the best and easiest ways to hear God's word is to get to places where God's word is clearly spoken. So that would be where? Reading our Bible, right? Being in church, listening to music that's based on Christ's word, and also just often finding a quiet place, right? Where there's not other noises coming in. So the easiest place to hear God's word is to intentionally get there. But there's another way to look at this. I don't think Simon Peter was there intentionally to hear God's word. He was cleaning his nets. He was probably kind of irritated that all the other people were there. Usually, fishermen, you know, they tend to be kind of solitary types, right? How many of you consider yourself an actual fisherman? They're the ones who wouldn't want to raise their hand because they don't want to draw attention to themselves, right? I, this is the truth. So I'm thinking Simon Peter initially is going, why are all these people in my space? Usually it's kind of quiet here at this time. I'm trying to get my job done and everybody is in my way and now this guy wants to use my boat. And here's the thing. God's voice is being spoken everywhere. To me, it's a little like a radio, radio waves that are going through the air at all times, but we just got to tune into the right channel, right? And so God can speak to you anywhere. He can speak to you in the craziest places. However, I always recommend to go to the places where it's easiest to hear, right? The least amount of static or distraction. So get in a place to hear God's word. Now, every step in this process of hearing God's voice and obeying has an obstacle. Uh, call it an internal obstacle or an obstacle Satan tries to throw across our path. Think of it however you want to, but there's always this obstacle. So the obstacle to hearing God's voice, especially in times for me when I'm struggling, when I'm internally suffering or having a hard time, the obstacle is avoidance, right? I just kind of try to avoid thinking too much about too many things. And often I try to avoid God altogether because I'm just not sure what he's going to say. We can also avoid by being really busy with work or other tasks or choosing useless things to fill our brains and our eyes with, social media and TV and hobbies. Anything to avoid hearing the still, small voice of God. And yet Jesus knew even how important this was. When he was on earth, it says in Luke 4, 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Right? He prioritized finding a place to hear his father's voice. In Luke 5, 16, it says he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Now let me encourage you that if you haven't done this for a while and you're a little intimidated by the thought of having this quiet space with God, you know, God doesn't require a whole lot of time every time. You can start really, really small. So I would encourage you to today, 
or tomorrow morning, just set aside five minutes. Don't go from zero to an hour, just five minutes. And get quiet and still and say, Lord, I'm ready to hear from you. It's funny, at different seasons of my life, I've been better at quiet time with God. Before I had children, I had lots of time. And so I was always the half hour, hour in the morning time with God person. I was committed. I was responsible. And then I had my first child and um, had an emergency C-section and a baby who cried nonstop. And I was a mess. I was a mess. And I went out and bought what I had always made fun of before, God's little devotional book for women that was like this tall and like, you know, a quarter of a page of reading that each day I could at least say I read something and spent time with God. And do you know God would meet me there in that tiny little one-quarter page? So often, day after day, God's voice would speak and give me just that little nugget I needed just for that day. This year has been a year of transition for us, and again, my morning has been far more hectic um, because I am getting my kids off to school now, and that little thing for me has become, I've updated, um, version on my iPhone, the Bible app, right? Any of you have that Bible app? And there is a verse for the day on that Bible app. One verse every day. And I can't tell you how many times that's what I have time for. I open up that app and I look at the verse for the day and I just sit with it for a while. And I say, Lord, what are you saying to me today? And again, I can't tell you how many times that one verse is what I need. Get in a place to hear the word of God. The second step is found in Luke 5, verse 3. It talks about uh, Jesus, at stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon Peter, its owner, to push it out into the water. Simon let his boat be used. This was his livelihood, his job. The second thing is to make your life available to God. And this is hard for some of us. We're good with like a minute or two or a Sunday morning, but saying, okay, God, it's all available to you. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what it's going to look like, but my hands are open. The obstacle here is my hardest one, and that's control. I expend a lot of time and energy trying to control my circumstances. Probably none of the rest of you do this. Um, and I have these things called but ifs and what ifs, right? So there's the, the but ifs are, but if my boss would see it this way, but if my husband would just take care of this, but if my mom would just stop doing that, but if this wouldn't have happened, if this would have happened, but if, but if, but if. When we make our lives available to God, we lay down the but ifs. And we also lay down the what ifs. That's our other one, right? Well, what if this were to happen? Well, what if this hadn't happened? The reality is, this is where I am today. And all I can do is offer exactly where I am. Open hands. What if we simply gave our lives to God just as they are right now? Broken, hurting, angry, numb. And we said, Lord, here I am, as I am. I think God can work with that. <laughs> In fact, Jesus started his public teaching ministry with blessings for people just like that. Matthew 5 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Just give whatever you have so that God can give you the blessing he has for you. I taught my VBS kids last week that the Beatitudes, all of the blesseds, and what I said is simply that we can't impress God in any way. He just wants us to offer up ourselves. 
we tend to think we have to do something to earn our way to impress God. And God says, will you just come with me? And so our art project that day was to draw our open hand with its lines and wrinkles and scars and calluses, each of them unique. We can make our lives available to God just as they are. The next element is to listen, then, for a direction. Look at Luke 5, 4. When he had finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, Now, go out where it is deeper and let down your nets, and you'll catch many fish. Now, this is just entertaining to me, right? Jesus is a rabbi. He is not a fisherman. Simon's a fisherman. Now, you all know whatever your chosen profession is, if the pastor were to stand up here and tell you how to do your job, you'd be highly irritated, right? You're like, you, didn't, you don't have the education, you don't have the experience, you don't know how to do what I do. And Jesus is saying, I'm telling you how to do your job, right? And then on top of it, he's telling Simon Peter to do it in a way that is contrary to everything Simon Peter knows, right? Fishermen. Do you go out in the middle of the day, in the middle of the lake, to catch fish? Anyone? No, right? Early in the morning or later in the evening. And you usually don't go out in the deep area. You stay right by the edge where the fish are all congregating. All of these things. And on top of it, the night before, they hadn't caught anything, right? So Simon Peter is going, in his head, if his head was like mine. And we know from other things in Simon Peter's life, he was a little impetuous, shall we say, right? So I'm, I'm imagining in his head, he's going, right, Jesus, why don't you tell me how to do my job? That makes no sense. You're not a fisherman. But God often asks us to do unexpected things, right? The obstacle we have is when we box God in. When we say, no, God, this is the way that I want you to work. This is the way it should work. This is the way I imagine it ought to work, right? And we do this all of the time. The amazing thing is, God's directions are always the best one. I mentioned in the introduction when God asked me to homeschool my children, that was the last possible thing I wanted to do. In fact, I possibly had said the words in the past, I will never homeschool. Pretty sure I said that. And here God was telling me, your son is struggling, he needs to do something different. And I was saying, it doesn't fit the box for me, God. And then God does these amazing things, right? We can't let, we can't box God in. Again, I mentioned back when uh, my first child was born, um, I, was, I was a wreck. I was barely making it from day to day. In fact, one of my closest friends at the time, a couple years later, thankfully, said to me, I wasn't sure you were going to make it, Joanna. I'm thinking, wow, that's great. Thanks. I, yeah. Um, but I was struggling. And when I went to God, do you know what God asked me to do? And we all think God asks us to do amazing things like always share Christ with our friends, which is a great thing to do, right? But do you know God tells us to do other things too, very mundane things? In fact, we sang something about that, that God shows up in the mundane, right in the song this morning, right? Do you know what God told me to do during those first few months of my child's life? Load the dishwasher every night. That was my direction from God. Do you know why? Because I had spent a lot of my years before that taking care of everybody else, and God was showing me how to take care of myself. And he knew that for my sanity, I needed to wake up every morning and have clean dishes and bottles. And so out of his great grace, he said, Joanna, the thing you need to do in this season of your life is to load the dishwasher every night. God really does speak that way sometimes. He enters right into the world where we are and gives us just the very specific direction that we need 
to make it through that day and through that season. Years ago, um, I read a book uh, by Mary Gee. She was a missionary in India called God Guides. And she talked about this process of sitting with a piece of paper and a pen in the morning and trying to listen for what God had for her to do today. And the very first thing God ever asked her to do, and I have never forgotten this, was to take an egg, one egg, to her neighbor. Her neighbor was someone she had not been getting along with very well. And um, she thought that was the most ridiculous thing in the world. Why would she take one egg? Her neighbor woman had children. And she thought, what good would one egg do, right? So all day long, she didn't do it. And finally, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, she thought, I really think this is what God asked me to do, so I feel like I better do it. I feel silly. So she didn't do it. She sent, like, an assistant over with the egg. And a few minutes later, the neighbor woman came crying over to her house and said, I had enough eggs to feed the rest of my family this morning, but not me. And not only was her need met, but their relationship began to be mended from that point on. Because God asked her to send an egg. Don't box God in. Let God tell you exactly what you need, what those around you need. Listen for his voice. I have one other story. Um, I mentioned the Nepali immigrants that came uh, to our church. Shortly after they came, we were doing something like a VBS, a, a weekend all-ages event at our church. And the weekend just before, um, I, I went to Ellie, who had been to all the houses of, of these refugees, and I had not yet. I had kind of met them on Sunday morning. A lot of them didn't speak English. Um, but I felt the Lord impressing on me that I should ask Ellie, could we go house to house and invite them to come to this event? Because they probably didn't understand the announcement on Sunday morning. And as we went, uh, we kept going to streets that I had done ministry on about 10 years before when I was in college. I, I mean to the street, neighborhoods and streets. And I thought it for a moment, this is God saying to me, this was a message for me. I was supposed to go to recognize this is the same area that God has been ministering through our church, and he's continuing to minister in a new way. That weekend, every single family we invited showed up at the event. And I was overjoyed and overwhelmed, and it was amazing. About two years later, I discovered that in Nepali culture, you would never go to a party or event unless you are personally invited. Does God know what he's doing? I had no idea what I was doing. I knew nothing about Nepali culture, but God did. And he sent us house to house to invite don't box God in. Let God tell you exactly what it is that you need to do for today. Has God asked you to do something, but it seemed too out of the box or too simple or mundane? It might be God's voice after all. Think about Joshua marching around the, the, the walls of Jericho, right? It seemed silly and out of the box, but God had a plan. Listen for a direction. And once you've heard the direction comes the moment of truth. I love Simon Peter's response in verse 5 where he says, Master, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing, but if you say so, we'll try again. I said, he had crazy things going on in his head, and I'm sure a lot of doubts, right? Confusion, doubts, questions. And here's what I love about God. He can handle that. You can say all those things to him. Nothing is a surprise to him. He's heard it before. He's heard the complaints, the questions, the doubts. Just say it. Get it all out. And then say, all right, Lord, if you say so. Right along with Simon Peter. The obstacle here is often fear, right? We're afraid of what others might think if we do something that's out of the box. We're afraid of what that might look like. We're afraid of trying something a new way. 
But 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. The other obstacle to doing it really simply is disobedience, or if you want to get even more harsh, rebellion, of saying, no, God, I won't do it. And I've been there too. Several years ago, I preach once a month at a local weekend homeless day shelter in Lansing. I've been doing it for years and years. Love my people there. They're actually easier to preach to than you are, strangely enough. Um, And I had been going for a couple of years, and God laid on my heart at the beginning of one year, January of one year, he said, Joanna, I, um, this month, I want you to offer communion at the shelter. And I heard that voice, and I said, God, that is too out of the box. I have never heard of anyone serving communion at a homeless shelter. I mean, they're mentally ill, they're addicted, they have alcohol on their breath, like that, I I can't do it. And besides, Lord, I mean, I think that you are for them, and I believe that, but there's these other pastors and church people who go there, and they're always there when I preach, and they're going to think I'm crazy, and they're going to think it's wrong that I shouldn't do that. So guess what? Every month, for 10 months, I would pray about what God wanted me to preach about, and every month he would say, I want you to serve communion, and every month I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm afraid of what people will think. In November of that year, I sat down to get God's message, and he said to me so clearly, Joanna, if you don't serve communion, you are directly disobeying me. And I knew. It was so clear to me, like, okay, if I don't do this, this, I might as well not even go. Called my mother, Lord, would you, Mom, would you pray for me? I'm so nervous about this. I don't know if it's the right thing. I think the other pastors are going to be so mad at me. And I showed up that morning, and I offered communion, and I said, you can come and line up if you're ready to receive. And as soon as I said, if you're ready, there was a line in front of me. And I realized, this is their church. And what are the special things we get at church? We receive the body and the blood of Jesus. We receive Jesus. And no one had offered it to them for years. And they were ready to receive whatever Jesus had for them. And I knew then that that was the right thing to do. But the frosting on the cake was at the very end of the service. Reverend Williams, who I was so afraid of what he thought, stood up and got in that line and received communion from me. And with tears in his eyes, he said, I never thought of this. All the years I've come here, I've never thought to serve them communion. This is the right thing. And the next month, he stood up next to me and served communion with me. And every month, (laughs) I serve communion at the homeless shelter now. And even my Catholic friends there, who again, I was so afraid that they were going to be so upset, have received communion from me. Why? Because God doesn't work in the box, right? And when he asks you to do something, you do it. And then you get to see, like Simon Peter did, the amazing things that God will do. And that is the next thing. When Simon Peter realized what happened in verse 8, he fell to his knees because suddenly, I mean, he had sort of seen Jesus before then. But when he listened and obeyed, he really saw Jesus clearly for who he was, right? And everyone around did. It said they were all awestruck. When we listen to God and obey his voice, we too get to see God in a new way that we've never seen before. We get a glimpse clearly of who he is. The obstacles to us seeing God simply are blindness. And all of us are kind of born with this blindness on our eyes, right? But think about, um, I don't know how many of you have glasses or have the ones in your eyes, right? But we have them because in some way we're blind. And I still remember when I was around 13 years old getting my first pair of glasses and I walked outside 
and mine are to see far away, and I could see the leaves on the trees for the first time in my life. I went, oh, people can see leaves on trees? I could see. But there's two kinds of blindness, friends. There's the kind that doesn't know that there were leaves to begin begin with. And then there's the chosen blindness. It's the, my daughter who I bought glasses last year, but she doesn't think they look cool enough on her, so she doesn't wear them anymore. The chosen blindness, right? We once saw, but now we just say, oh, that just happened, that's just luck, things happen. Listen to God's voice, obey him, and let him open your eyes to the ways he's at work all around you. The key question for this simply is, where is God in this? And that question is so beautiful because it works in the good times and the bad times, right? Where is God in this? On Facebook a few years ago, there was a, there's a thing and it keeps popping up from time to time. Whenever there's a tragedy, um, people quote Mr. Rogers. Have you all seen that? It said Mr. Rogers says, when something bad happens, look for the helpers. Look for where God is at work. I want to tell you, Williamston Free Methodist Church, I was here a few weeks ago for Pastor Brad's funeral, and wow, your church, you are the helpers. You were amazing. You have come around people and supported. God is at work in you. Don't forget that. Don't choose blindness at a time when you're hurting. Instead, say, where is God in this? Look for his hands holding you up. Look for the people he sends your way. And don't reject them. Receive them. He'll get you through. The last thing in finding your way forward that's so beautiful is that when we have, have listened to God, when we've obeyed his voice, when we've seen his clear, his, him clearly, he then shows us ourselves clearly. Simon Peter, as soon as he saw God clearly, he fell to his knees and said, I'm a sinner, you shouldn't even be around me, right? But you know what's beautiful? That was Simon Peter's view of himself. What was Jesus' view of, him, of Peter? Jesus said, don't be afraid, I have something for you to do. There's two parts of all of us. There's the Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know, when we're truly in the presence of God, that it's not us who's doing it, right? It's God. But there's the other part of us too, the Genesis 1 part that says, you were created in the image of God. And he has a purpose and a plan for you. He's given you special gifts and abilities that he hasn't given anyone else. And he has jobs for you to do, just like he did for Simon Peter. Let God show you who he is, and then let him show you how he sees you. Let him show you both your weaknesses, your brokenness, and your gifts and your strengths. So that then you can start that circle once again, listening for his word to you, listening for his direction, obeying and seeing him clearly again. I think of the little boy with the five loaves and the two fish that were given to Jesus. And they were, the disciples were apologetic, right? This is all we have. But that little bit plus Jesus is always enough. It's always enough. In the end, Jesus goes back and gives Simon Peter another direction, right? Go and become a fisher of men. It's this thing that happens over and over and over again. It doesn't stop. Sometimes it's moment by moment. God, what do I need to do in this moment? Sometimes that's as far as we can think ahead. And that's all right. God will meet us there. Sometimes it's day by day. This is what I have for you today, to do today. Sometimes God has given me an instruction, and it's for a year or so. 
this is what I want you to do. And that's the priority that I have for that year. And I know, and I return to it all the time. And God doesn't give me something new. He just keeps saying, nope, still do that. That's all right. But just stay in a place where you can hear his voice. The rest of Peter's life was a practice in learning how to listen and say yes to Jesus. A wonderful homework for you to do, if you'd like, is to keep reading in Luke and then in Acts and just look for all of these instances in Simon Peter's life where he had to follow Jesus. And you'll take comfort because sometimes he did it really, really well and sometimes he was called, oh, Satan, get thee behind me, right? Simon was just like the rest of us. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. But the joy is in to keep going on the journey, to find the way forward. So as we close today, there's just a few questions for you to think about. You want to close your eyes for a minute and just focus. Where are you in that circle? Are you in a place to hear the word of God regularly? Have you made your life available to God? Have you taken the time to listen for a direction? Are you stuck because you know what you're supposed to do, but you just haven't done it? Are you needing to see God in a new way? Are you needing to see yourself in a new way? God can meet you at each one of those places. And what I encourage you to do this morning is simply to open your hands and say yes. Whatever it is that God's asking you to do, to simply say, all right, Lord, let's find the way forward together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you meet us where we are. You met Simon Peter at his workplace. You'll meet us wherever we are today. Thank you that when you meet us, you don't take off and leave us. You walk with us, giving us direction and helping us find our way forward again. Lord, I pray for each individual here that you would speak directly the words that each needs to hear today, words of comfort, words of action, words of healing, words of courage. Lord, speak. And Lord, I pray for this church at large. You are not finished with the work that you have started in this place. And how grateful we are for that. And I pray that you would take this church and lead them through this process of healing and courage and waiting and finding new ways forward. We trust you, Lord, and we thank you that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Thank you all, and have a good week.